Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted Gardner, and uh, I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress Oral History Project, which is so capably handled by our wonderful public library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. And Dennis Daly, historian, is our videographer. And today we're talking with Dr. Henry Heimlich, a famous man, a very important man, and a resident of Cincinnati for many years. He and his wife, Jane, who is, Jane is an accomplished author in homeopathic medicine and health. And of course, she came from a famous family, the Arthur Murray family, uh, who were the dancing team of America back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. So we have with us uh, Dr. Henry Heimlich today, and uh, uh, Doctor and I have known each other and been friends for a long time, and uh, so I'm just going to refer to him, if you don't mind, in our old familiar term that we call you Hank. If I can call you Ted. Ah, thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor. Well, Hank, where were you born? I was born in Wilmington, Delaware. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Yes. Yes, yes. And um, I spent my first year there. My family decided to move to New Rochelle, New York, a suburb oh, that, of New York City. That was a good move, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> and uh, I know that you had an older sister. Yes. And what is her name? Her name is Cecilia. Ce we call her Seal, of course. Seal. Okay. And. Um, uh, so then you, you started your, your elementary education in New Rochelle? Correct. And then high school? High school in New Rochelle High. Okay, and then after high school, what did I you do? I went to Cornell University oh. up in Ithaca, New York. Right. And I was supposed to be, I was class of 41. Uh -huh. I, I got there, however, and I was surprised, but I got into medical school in 40, so I had three years there. Well, that was excellent. And um, I went to Cornell Medical College, which mm -hmm. is in New York City. High above Cayuga's waters. That was where the college was, <laughs> right. but I lived at home when I went to the medical college. Okay, and uh, tell us about your parents. Well, I had wonderful parents, very giving and very good people. Yes. Uh, for example, my mother's, my mother's mother died of tuberculosis, not uncommon in those days. Oh. And her father remarried someone we spoke of as, or they spoke of as a real stepmother in the worst sense. And she had five brothers and sisters. And they, this woman wanted to separate them and just let them go to foster homes. Oh my, goodness. my mother, who was 15, took them all together and moved them into a separate apartment. And with the brothers doing some work, selling newspapers and whatever, they were able to live and get along and grow. What a story. Uh, all of the brothers and sisters were very prominent in their work and in what they did. Hmm. So it was a most unusual situation. My dad was a prison social worker. His name was Phil, Phil Philip Heimlich. And he used to go around to the state prisons in New York State to visit the prisoners. And didn't pay very much. Mm -hmm. So for our vacations, he took my sister and I with him. I was maybe 12, and she was five or six years older. Surprisingly, we were allowed to walk through the prisons and sit and talk to the prisoners in their cells. What an experience. And we did this in Sing Sing one time and came back to the warden's office. We always came back there. And he was with a commissioner. And the commissioner said, Warden, how do you let these children walk through the prison? And the warden said, 
Oh, everyone knows they're Phil Heimlich's kids, and that was all he had to say. Oh, isn't that something? I was wonderful. very fortunate. Very wonderful tribute to your father. Yes, indeed. To speak so highly of him. Uh, <clears throat> and you remember those days. Oh, couldn't forget them. I even I'm... sat in the electric chair. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was funny then. Yes, yes, I should say. Well, um, uh, your years in, uh, in medical school were spent in New York, were they? Correct. Cornell University Medical yes. School in New York. And was that right in the city? That's right in New York City. I used to take the bus from my family's home every that? day, yeah. Well, that, that, that is just remarkable. <clears throat> so then when, when did you get your medical degree? Well, uh, here again I moved up. I had gained a year uh, when I left undergraduate college. And um, the war came along oh, in 41. Yes. So they stopped vacations in medical college, meaning I got out six months earlier sure, than I sure should have gotten yeah. out. Should have gotten out in 44, got out in 1943. Uh -huh. uh, sort of in the last year, it was the last year, uh, we were made midshipmen in the Navy. Those of us who joined the Navy, the right. Army also uh, was there. And we actually received some income. and. Uh, that lasted as long as we were in medical school. It mm -hmm. lasted for me about uh, six months, I would say, at that time. And I got out in December of 1943. Well, that was a very fortunate thing for you, too, wasn't it? Well, it was... It to, was have your, to have your education paid for. Uh, well, just that six months. <laughs> okay, okay. Then I was in the reserve then. I right. was U.S. Naval Reserve and allowed nine months of internship, which I had at Boston City Hospital in oh, Boston. Boston. That was in surgery. Now, you were an ensign at that time, right? Uh, no, well, I, I was in the reserves, so okay. I was inactive. Okay. Um, at the end of the nine months, uh, that would be September of 44, I went into the active Navy as a lieutenant junior grade. Mm -hmm. My first assignment was to the Chelsea Navy Hospital. I was there two weeks and uh, transferred to a re remarkable position. I was at Great Diamond Island off of Portland, Maine. And there was a Navy base, a receiving station where all the ships came in and uh, so sailors and crew who were waiting to be transferred to another position came there. Hmm. And I was a doctor there for several months. I had to sit through uh, oyster, uh, oyster meals and, uh, <laughs> and uh, clam bakes, you know, and things like that. And I was uh, arriving from the shore one day and, uh, and uh, a captain from our from the Navy base came off. He said, "Heimlich, you've got a letter waiting for you." So I couldn't wait till the, the little boat got over there. And here was a letter that said, "I was being transferred to U.S. Naval Group China in Washington D.C." Mm -hmm. And I had a week or two at home before I had to go went down there and uh, they sat me down after a few days. They put, we were in a hotel, it was quite another great experience. <laughs> and then one day they called me in and I had to sort of report in every day. They said, come over today. And they went into a closed office with two Navy officers, commanders. And they looked at me and they said, uh, Heimlich, uh, we have a duty here which is purely voluntary. All we can tell you is that it's extra hazardous, prolonged duty in China, period. Couldn't tell me any more. 
You can take it or you can leave it. Well, I wasn't being a hero. I honestly felt if I'm going to get it, I would rather see China than some landing beach somewhere. Right. Which you did say. Uh, so I did volunteer on the spot. Went back and I had another week or two and I got a call at the hotel and they said, uh, you have a letter here if you can drop in sometime <laughs> today and get it. Those letters. <laughs> so I went right over for my letter and what it was, was orders uh, that I was to leave Washington two days later and I was to be at the railroad station to take a train to the airport for where I would be leaving for China. Well, I got to the airport and there were actually a hundred of us there and a uh, few officers, mostly enlisted men. And uh, they said, well, we're not going to the airport. That was to confuse anybody mm -hmm. I might read the orders. We're this was all a very secret thing. Oh, totally secret. Absolutely. Uh, we were not allowed to wear insignia, our khaki or gray uniforms, without insignia. And that goes for officers and men. And uh, so they say, you're getting right here on a troop train. And indeed we did. And it was pretty rough living on the troop train. So we were young enough, uh, I guess I was 24, 25. Right. We were young enough to tolerate it and had a pretty hectic ride across the country. It was a long uh, time. Stopping at places for a long time, switching engines and so forth. And two days before we got to where we were going, which we knew was Los Angeles, I sneaked off the train once and I called my sister. My sister, as I say, was six years older than I. She was a lieutenant junior grade in the Navy and her base was San Pedro, California. Mm -hmm. She was one of six waves six wave officers who were um, uh, not pilots. Uh, oh, navigators. Uh, pardon? Navigators. Navigators, I'm sorry. They were navigators in the <clears throat> Navy, uh, aerial navigators. Mm -hmm. And they flew pilots and co-pilots on a big plane and taught them to navigate out of the celestial navigation, celestial navigation yeah. ocean navigation. Right. And I told her when we were going to get in, and two days, she was there. The day went by, no train. She was about to leave and some said a troop train is coming in and it did come in. <laughs> and she joined me that day. And I only had that my last day, my last day in the country before going overseas. I spent that day and night with my wonderful sister. Isn't that remarkable? And uh, the next morning she drove me to the ship, the Ad <laughs> Admiral Benson, and I went on board. Well, the Admiral Benson, that, that was a very famous uh, transport. That was a troop transport. Back and forth across the Pacific. We were going, we didn't know where. We knew we were going to end up in China. But as it turned out, we did exactly zigzag 32 days. Wow. We, we did go for two days to Melbourne, Australia and couldn't get off, which was too bad. Yes. And then went on to India to Bombay. Now Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And we had about a week in Bombay. And we got on a train across India. Whoa. And that took over a week. Oh, yeah. It's kind of sleeping out, you know, on a bench and you know, on a, a <laughs> troop train. And every once in a while, when the train would stop, and it would stop when a cow crossed the tracks, because they were cows are holy. 
And we'd go out with our big cups, aluminum cups, and the engineer would pump steam out, and that's how we got fresh water to drink. How about that? We landed in Calcutta to at an army base. <clears throat> and there was also a group of Navy men there from my organization, which I learned was sa called SACO, S-A-C-O, the Sino-American Cooperative Organization. <laughs> it was also uh, called uh, U.S. Navy, uh, sorry, U U.S. Navy Group China. U.S. Okay. Navy Group China. Oh, yeah. U.S. NGC. Yeah. Well, we were, I was there two weeks. Now, had you been prepped at all? Did you know what you were going to be, what, what, what your purpose was going to be in Asia? I knew nothing. I knew about it what you now know. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that really was tight. Now, because it was secret, they, finally they took me to a plane. And uh, it was a Chinese National Airways Corporation, a private company from China, so I, I couldn't fly military. I had my uniform without markings, and I was alone. There were other people on the plane, but I was alone. And uh, I didn't know where I was going to go. It had holes in the window <laughs> with a pig corking around it so that if an, a zero, a Japanese zero attacked us, we would have fired through those holes. <laughs> and to use, they used me to carry material over for, my, for where I was going, not for me, courier. but for them, official you, material. You were a courier. That's right, they made me a courier to do that. And I had six. 45 uh, festivals over my shoulders and a huge mail bag. <laughs> I had no idea what was in it. <laughs> and we went up, we flew up, and then I knew we were going over the Himalayas, over the hump, if you remember what it was called. Yeah. Highest flight in the world. Whew. And I got to see something of the Himalayas. But we hit, I think, 17,000 feet high and we all passed out. I don't know how we'd have shot at a zero. Yeah. Uh, but the pilot and co-pilot were the only ones that had masks of oxygen. The next thing I knew, I suddenly woke up and there were rice paddies on the hills. Oh, and we were in China. Yeah. Landed in uh, one city and then went right on to Chongqing. We ate there. There was no food on the plane, of course. And uh, at Chongqing, we landed on a small island on the river that flows through Chongqing and got off. And there were steps going up. And I, they had a sea dan chair with Chinese to carry me up the steps to the top. <laughs> and while I was waiting up there for something, a pickup of some sort, and had all these things with me and the guns. <laughs> Some wonderfully beautiful little Chinese boys ran up and played with the guns and so forth. And I got on this truck that came along to pick me up and took me to the base. And this was the base of the U.S. Navy Group China. Now, how far was that from Chongqing? Was that a great distance? It was, it was a few hours drive, Oh, but it was within the... Yeah. Chongqing area. was the provisional capital of China at the, that time. At that time, they Chiang Kai-shek had his headquarters in yeah. Chongqing. That was not Japanese held That's right. quarters, headquarters. Yeah. Or t there were no Japanese Way there. Way in the interior. Right. <clears throat> it was there they sat me down and told me about U.S. Naval Group China. Admiral, uh, the, the, this admiral, oh, he at that time he was a commander, had been sent by 
uh, United States to China. We were not in the war yet. It was a couple of years or a year before the war, before we got in the war. And he was to get the Chinese to uh, make certain magnetic mines, they said they had the material, floating mines to bomb ships. Explosives. But they were going to try it. You see, we were not in the war yet. Yeah. Uh, when he got there, and it was quite a while before his trip originated, the U.S. had provided, and per Roosevelt, per President Roosevelt personally, had provided some substantial sum of money for what they want, really wanted us for. And the man who was to become uh, Admiral, they called him Admiral Miles, that was his nickname, because he was named after a, an actress whose name was Miles Mentor. And <laughs> oh. <laughs> don't ask me how that how no, he, he had a picture of it. That's a whole other story, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> he was Admiral Miles. Uh, there were the uh, Ch Chiang Kai shek had appointed his chief of secret police, his general. Mm -hmm. A guy with a terrible reputation, but appointed him to head our group. And he took Admiral Miles, later Admiral, to, through China in peasants' uniforms to show that he controlled police throughout China. Oh. So Miles came back with that tell, and that's when Roosevelt provided the funds for this Navy group. That it would be for secure Sacco, over there. For Sacco. Yeah. And uh, we so had bases all over China, small groups. We had four men in Shanghai who were in peasant uniforms mm -hmm. during the war who radioed to our submarines when a, a, a Japanese ship would head out oh, toward the China oh, Sea. Yeah. And it wasn't until many years later, it was here, when the uh, Cincinnati submarine, mm -hmm. the one named some retired, uh, yes. and their officers came here, yes. and I mentioned to one of them, I was with Naval Group China, yeah. he said, we were out there getting your signals to hit the Japanese Isn't ships. Isn't that remarkable? Then, yeah. But anyway, I got sick for a week from, on the food, which... Bad food, bad food. It was not that bad, but... It, was intestinal. <laughs> and they called me in and they said, uh, we've got, you're replacing a certain doctor who is up at a camp in Inner Mongolia. Now, this would be 1945. This would be 44, okay. early 45. Uh, next day I was on a plane to a small town in China actually a nice little hotel, and I met with three other men there who were the weathermen, one officer, commander, and two enlisted men. And I began finding out more about what we were doing there and where we were going. So we were going up to the Gobi Desert. It was a trip of several weeks. Yeah. We got on a truck one day, and by the way, we were treated so well by the military men in China where we were then, and always were treated well. We got on a truck, and the first layer on the truck were 100 gallons tanks, 100 gallon tins of gasoline, because of course there are no gas stations <laughs> that time in China. Uh, the commander, the driver, and the driver's assistant were in the front, and on top of the cans were, our, were goods that the driver was going to sell when he got up to Inner Mongolia. Then was a pile of our bedrolls, and we were on top of that. <laughs> and uh, we get on our way. We're not going an hour or two, 
and the truck breaks down, the motor. It was an old Dodge, by the way. It wasn't a military truck. Again, oh, we're see. not in uniform. We're, we're in uniform without sig sig significant. Uh, he takes, that's where the Chinese are very, they take the whole motor apart. They didn't look for what was wrong and put it together right. And the motor started, but it was too late. We went back to the hotel for the night and left the next morning <laughs> for a, a drive of several thousand miles. Oh, God. We went through the Ordos Desert on the way. All I can tell you is that within a few minutes, we were, those of us who were outside <laughs> were covered with sand and dust, and you could just see our eyes, nostrils, and a mouth. Wow. And, uh, but it was the most interesting trip you could conceive of. Walled in cities. Mm -hmm. And why were they walled in? Because for centuries, bandits would attack the city and rob them. Sure. So we got into these walled in cities and we'd spend a night or a couple of nights. Well, they went back to the days of Genghis Khan and so forth. Yeah, oh, it was, it was, <laughs> China was, had not changed in the 5,000 years. Right. The China we were in, they were dressed the same, the customs were the same, and they couldn't have been more generous. And the food was excellent, mm. very good. Well, each day we'd set off and there'd be another thing to see <laughs> and another thing to do. I can remember we moved, we were in one little city and there was no place to stay. And we stayed in a, uh, a monk's uh, monastery that was unmanned actually. And it was raining and we, we couldn't go on, it was pouring. So we caught the rain in a pail and thought we could drink it. Fresh water. Except it was so dirty we, we, we couldn't. So. Well, at any rate, we eventually ended up in a marvelous city called Lingxia in northwest China. It was a beautiful city ruled by an emperor. His name was Ma Hongwei. And if we have time, I'll tell you how he came into my life many years ago. Well, since then, too. But it was a beautiful city. He had a wonderful guest house. He fed us wonderfully. On the way down, the doctor who was replacing me came down on a truck with a few others going back home. And he was leaving because he had broken his tooth. And he had broken it in a basketball game with the Chinese soldiers, <laughs> which was always very tough. <laughs> he got knocked down. <laughs> okay. That's why I was replacing him. You were his replacement. Ma okay. Hung Wei was very plump. And he said to me, I hear that in the United States they can operate and make you thinner. I said, yes, they do. And he was looking at me and I was hoping he was gonna say, you do that for me, <laughs> which he did not. But it turned out that his, in Ningxia, they had the best, I didn't know this till after the war, the best Chinese opera company. Really? In the country. In that city? I later saw them after the war in the East. They were invited all over. Hmm. And it was marvelous, but it was almost every night and it lasted for hours. <laughs> and after a while, it's kind of worrying. <laughs> well, when the, the truck with the doctor came down, another truck came down. The other men went off in a different direction. They were actually heading for the part of Western China that was controlled by the Chinese communists. Oh, yeah. I got on their truck, and we stopped in the middle of the desert uh, on the way up to where we were going, and we the ne there was a little hut there, wooden, a, a, a mud hut. We then drove on up. We had to cre cross the Yellow River three times. And they had big open, just an open wooden, we can't call it a boat, a float. Mm -hmm. And it had two huge oars made out of the trunks of trees. <laughs> and the truck was driven on a couple of boards and it hung over each side. They rode as hard as they could across the river and we ended up several miles below and they 
Wow. We got off. The next night we spent there at a monastery. There was a Spanish monastery, Catholic. Hmm. And if Spain was not in the war, you see, they could stay. Uh, the Western countries could not. And that was wonderful, entertaining and goodness and everything else. And music. Mm -hmm. The next day we arrived at camp. Camp was in a Walden city, a Walden compound inside a city back, uh, in China. A tiny town, actually, mm -hmm. on one side of it. And the group was living there. What were they doing there? There were 12 of us. The code name was the Apostles. <laughs> we had five Navy and five Marines. The Marines trained 250 Chinese guerrillas to protect us because we were behind Japanese lines. The Navy had two Navy weathermen. We got the weather, they got the weather, every night, every day, three days before it hit the Pacific, mm -hmm. and radioed it every day. Every movement your ship made, or a plane made, was based on ours, and there were other groups around. God bless you. So that was what it was for. Now, were you aware, finally, were you aware of what, <laughs> what you were there for? When I got there, I was. Yeah. <laughs> I really didn't know for sure. Right. <laughs> But what were my orders were to keep the, jet, the Chinese on our side. Yes. That's why they wanted a doctor there. Right. Not to take care of sure. the other 11 men. Yeah. Well, the Chinese wouldn't come to me. They had never seen a foreign devil. A Western, yeah. Well, they, we had, the, their men had been there and hadn't mixed with them <clears> much. And so I didn't have any patience <laughs> until three weeks after I was there, a peasant came with his, I found out, 18-year-old daughter unconscious on his, his back. They came, he walked up, I don't know how far he had come, and his daughter was all swollen and she was unconscious. She hadn't eaten for a couple of weeks, I think had vomit, vomited some, and it was late in the afternoon, and we didn't have electricity, so, and in truth, I must say honestly, I had nine months of a surgical internship. <laughs> I really didn't have a, what, no, I could handle this. It was almost justifying letting her die, and then I couldn't do it. Since there were no lights, I said if she lived till morning, I would do the operation. I had made intravenous solution. Not intravenous, it wasn't good enough, intravenous. You gave it subcutaneously. I had done this by having, I had two carmen. One boiled water in a kettle that had a tubing going up and circled down so that it condensed and was sterile. And I caught it in the a jar I had been boiling water, boiled water in. And I put salt tablets in it as close as I could get to blood salt to normal solution. But I, again, I, in those days, as a matter of fact, even at the hospital, we didn't give many intravenous solutions. The hospital made up the solutions and it was given under the skin. So I gave it to her overnight. She was a little better. Next morning, I gave her a spinal anesthesia, and I operated on her. And it, this was on a table I had, had made when I arrived by the coffin maker, where you could raise and lower the head <laughs> and feet. And uh, I cut into the abdomen very slowly. As I got to the lining, the peritoneum, I cut through, and yellow-green pus gushed all over oh. us. And I just screamed with pleasure. Yeah. It was the only thing I could have treated if it were a tumor or something worse. Oh, I could never infection. have been able to bring that. 
instead I just drained it wide. In a week she was well and she went home. Oh my gosh. From that time I had 100 to 200 patients a day. They, <laughs> truly, they, I saw diseases no doctor was going to see after that. You name it. Yeah. And advanced diseases that, you know, of what... Terrible. And uh, it, it was very most worthwhile then. Now, how long were you out at that station? Well, I was there till the war, till a few months after the war so was over. So about six months, maybe, huh? I would say. Uh huh. And uh, well, you had such tremendous experience now. Yeah. With all these, <laughs> with all, all this influx of patients yeah. coming to you because they could trust you, wasn't that the idea? Yes. Now, in addition, there was across the town from us, a General Futsoe. He was really, had his own army of 100,000, but was loyal to Chiang Kai-shek. It was the last one who actually stayed intact and fought the Japanese. Mm. Most of the Chinese had become puppets, the army. He sent for me, and I was to keep him on our side if I could too. Of course. And he had heard of this girl being saved. So we talked. And I got the idea and said, General, I'd like to make a, a medical corps for you. Well, in 5,000 years, no Chinese army had a medical corps. He gave me his 25 best men. They came over and I trained them. Right. And he and I stayed in touch. And he became, and I hope we have time for this, he became part of my whole future life. Really? Very much of what I, I was doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, occasionally, very rarely, a Japanese plane would fly over and we'd run out in the desert where we had dug holes and climb into it because we figured if they're going to hit anything, they'll hit our buildings, mm -hmm. our mud huts there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we, are, we also had a Chinese guerrilla army about a day's drive away from us, full day's drive, in a, another small city, not, not a smaller city, a walled-in city called Bauto. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And it is now a big manufacturing town. And we had two of our men out there, and they had Chinese guerrillas, and occasionally they'd battle the Chinese puppets but they would all shoot in the air. It was that kind of thing. However, one day where I was, one of our Chinese soldiers got shot in the chest. And that day, even in our armies, you're shot in the chest on the battlefield, you die. You needed a tube in the chest that goes to suction that's regulated to take the blood and air out so the lungs don't collapse. Uh, I didn't know, I had nothing like that. I tried to operate on him, he died in my hands. And he was, I was young, he was the first patient who died in my hands. Mm -hmm. I never forgot him. I'm sure. And I'll finish telling you about China and I'd like to tell you about what that man resulted for. Right. right. At any rate, it was a an experience that couldn't be duplicated. Did you suffer from the weather there and the blowing sand and the constant winds? And no, it was, it was quite comfortable. It was? It was quite comfortable. Yes, there were blowing winds. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that astounded people was that I had the holes in the ground that were toilets covered over and off. <laughs> I, I had the, uh, the well covered over and so far. At any rate, General Fu Tsui, after the war, marched his army to what well, is Beijing, Peking, or Beiping, it mm -hmm. was, uh, in 1946. When the war was over, I got to Shanghai, was assigned to Shanghai, 
and got onto the hospital ship Repose as a doctor, and I was six months there. The Repose was a very famous ship. Now, what happened, that was in 46. Right after the war, Fu Tsui got to Beiping, and he had command of it. Three years later, in 49, and this is taught in all the Chinese schools. I didn't know that until I went back to China. Mm -hmm. It was taught in all the Chinese schools. His daughter was 22. She kept harping on him. Father, uh, people are starving here. They're rioting. Don't fight and destroy this city. Finally, he sent her out to, to the Chinese communist troops that had encircled all the big cities. She arranged a date to open the gates to Peking. The troops came in, nobody was killed, mm -hmm. and the civil war was over in China. Oh my. Now that's typically Chinese, deciding who's going to win rather than fighting. Isn't that something? Therefore, Fu Tsui became very high, and his family, his daughter. Subsequently, subsequently I was at the World's Fair in 1983 in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I had the first Chinese exhibit. I, I, it was a wait of two hours or three hours, but I was a guest, so I got right in. I could still speak Chinese. Mm -hmm. I spoke to the head of it and told him I was general, with General Fu Tsui. Ah, and he told me the story of Fu Tsui. <laughs> Everyone has taught it in school in China. Oh, wow. When I was leaving, he said, come quick. And he took me over and there's a man doing Chinese paintings. This man lives in the same house in Beijing as General Fu's daughter. I wrote on a scrap of paper, I wonder if any of your father's friends remember me. And nine months later, I got a letter from her saying they all remember you and they want you to come to China. And Jane and I were invited back. Two day, we, they gave me a dinner in the Great Hall of the People with their Chinese soldiers that oh. knew me. Uh, two days after President Reagan had his dinner there, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, I uh, had another trip back where I visited where I had been in Nina, Mongolia, and met people who I had treated as children there. And then I got invited back to do my, my research. And I did my AIDS research by virtue of the secretary of medicine there, medical secretary of the government, and his group in uh, Guangzhou. Well, you know, it's remarkable what you have accomplished, and <clears throat> but how you very diplomatically and scientifically, of course, and uh, medically, could impress upon these people. And it opened doors for you, and you helped them, and you learned so much from that experience. It was, as I say, and that with I, my going over there for several weeks at a time for the next several years as we were completing our I remember research. remember when you were doing that. Was a, such a one. And I was, I'm so warm for the Chinese. They are, let's set faces, a tremendous culture. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I admire them very much. Yeah, well. But there was one thing that happened that has been one of the most meaningful things in my life. Uh, I, was, I wrote a book. I was a very, one of the first, I was number 139 to become a chest surgeon, a thoracic surgeon in this country. In, in 1962 and three, I wrote a small book on post care in, uh, uh, in thoracic surgery, post operative care in thoracic surgery. And I pointed out that when someone is shot in the chest or you open the chest, for surgery or the lung collapse, cause a balloon, pneumothorax, cause air gets loose in the chest. 
They put a tube in the chest and connect you to regulated suction. Mm -hmm. And that takes out the air in the blood. And it's, they're kept in bed for two or three weeks on this, and then they take the tube out. It's healed. And I wrote and I said, most doctors know how to use this, but they don't know how it works. It works like a valve. It lets blood and air out, nothing back in, so the lung expands as they breathe. And I thought, why not a valve? And very shortly after, invented this little apparatus. Right. It's the Heimlich chest drain valve. I don't know if this will do it, but it's a flat piece of tubing. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. oh. I, w I knew that type of valve was the best because it was always closed, but it would let everything through. Sure. You heard the noise. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I went to what was the five and 10 cent store. It's the five <laughs> and $10 store now. <laughs> and I got a noisemaker and sterilized it. A man came into the hospital with a collapsed lung from a, a, a bubble burst. I put a tube in his chest and put the, what I call the valve, the noisemaker on him <laughs> and took x-rays every few hours. And the chest, immediately the lung came up and stayed up. I took this to Beck and Dickinson and Company. Immediately they saw it and started manufacturing it. Word. Uh, I was presenting it <clears throat> in 1964, it had come out. And I was presenting it at an Amer AMA, American Medical Association meeting. After it, four com medical com uh, a commander and four officers together came up to me and said, Dr. Heimlich, I'm going to fly into Maryland. This was in New York. I'm going to fly in from Maryland tomorrow. I'd like you to give me six of these vows to take to Vietnam. It was 64 and the Vietnamese War was on. We did that. A week later, I have got a telegram, which I preserve, three pages, saying the Heimlich chest drain valve is a life-saving item, must have 100. Wow. By the end of the Vietnam War, what they were doing the valve on a tube was in a sterile envelope carried in every soldier's pocket. If your buddy got shot in the chest, all you did is take your tube and put it in the bullet hole, put a piece of tape here. The blood and air came out and the lung came up. At the end of the war, hundreds had been saved. I was at a meeting once where I didn't know uh, was not in regard to this, a medical meeting, and a doctor stood up and said to me and to them, I was on Hill 881, one of the toughest battles in the war. 34 of my men got shot in the chest and 32 got off with Heimlich chest drain valves. Oh, my goodness. I ended up in 1993, we didn't have relations yet, people of people ambassadors, 20 other chest surgeons and myself going to meet with the chest surgeons of Vietnam. When we arrived at the airport, we were introduced to their people. The, the head, of, as we, I was introduced, the head of their chest surgeons said, oh, Dr. Heimlich needs no introduction. Everybody knows his name in Vietnam. And so I thought it was the Heimlich maneuver, of course, yeah. until he said, the Heimlich chest drain valve saved tens of thousands of our people. Oh, my goodness. A church group in the United States kept them supplied isn't with that, a valve. Isn't that remarkable? Thousands of their people were saved. Yeah. I have to tell you, the next morning, when he opened the meeting, he said, Dr. Heimlich will live in the hearts of the Vietnamese people forever, and I cried. Oh, I can imagine so. Ted, now mostly in civilian life, yes. always available in military life, of course. Last year, 150,000 chest drain valve were used. People who have a collapsed lung now 
from the more thorax mm -hmm. you put through tube with the valve on in the it's emergency very, room. It's a very simple thing, yes, isn't it? They go home. Isn't that amazing? Yes, they go home. Yeah. And uh, come back in two weeks and the tube is taken out. They used to have to stay in the hospital for that time. Yes. So this is one of the most meaningful things to me. I should say so. Yeah. Well, among other things, of course, you've done, uh, of course, everyone knows about your, the Heimlich maneuver. And uh, that has become almost a, a generic term anymore. And you're in the, in the dictionary and, and you're in the encyclopedia and all of that, all of that uh, tremendous thing. You, your, human, your humanitarianism is worldwide, Hank, and people recognize that and know you. And I know that, uh, that you have had the opportunity to speak around the world to people who need your help. Ted, in 1998, I was invited to Vietnam. I'm sorry, I take that back, that's <laughs> terrible. I was invited to Iran to lecture. It was the height of, the height of our enmity. I spoke at universities, hospitals, <laughs> medical colleges, and on television. Three days before I left, I was interviewed in a press conference. This young woman with her, her door on, after they've asked me questions, said, what do you think of President Hatame? Well, Hatame was the president who wanted to get together with the United States, if you recall. And there was talk very recently of his running again, mm -hmm. but he allowed another man to supplant him who he felt had a better chance to be less conservative in their sense more liberal. And I had read of the mayor being arrested five days before I got there. I was kind of tight, what shall I answer? And I just then decided I'm going to speak from my heart. I said, President Hatami wants to bring us all together. He wants to bring people together. And we have a program at the Heimlich Institute in Cincinnati called A Caring World. It's my program. President Hatami obviously believes in a caring world. The next morning, in the national newspaper, which is in English and in Farsi, has a one-inch headline, A Caring World, the slogan of Heimlich. And it gave from the Encyclopedia Britannica, I gave a half a page of what I have done in the past, and then in a few paragraphs, told of this response. Marvelous. And you know, I feel very definitely, we have the potential for a caring world today. Uh, even before President Obama was here, it was obvious if we traded with a country, you know, after, the, after 49, we were going to war with China for several years, many years. Oh, yeah. And suddenly we started manufacturing stuff and they started selling stuff to us. Suddenly there was no talk of war and there hasn't been since. That's right. And the answer to peace in the world is to go to the poorer countries and establish trade with them in some way build up their economy. And that's the end of the wars. Yeah. So I at least have some hope. President Obama is speaking to people, uh, talking about getting together. I don't know that that will do it. But if we can just bring it to these trade relationships, mm -hmm. I'm sure it will be a great advantage. Well, that is the hope of the world, Hank. Yeah. And you are riding that crest. You have been a, a leader, a forerunner 
in so many ways and this tremendous and and the amazing thing of of this valve invention is is the simplicity of it it, it it's technical and effective but it, it doesn't take a huge machine or tanks or anything like that well the heimlich maneuver is simple too isn't it yes now, and that one I knew, unless the whole public knew it, it's useless. Yeah, you can't just take those who are taking a CPR course. Oh, I know. In fact, CPR has changed anyway. It's dropped the, the breathing part, as yes. you know, for the heart. Gotcha. So <laughs> I spent a long time making it very simple. And making it so you can do it this way. You can do it lying down on the floor if the yes. person is unconscious. You do a lying on the floor if it's a young woman or a child who's not strong enough to reach around the choking person, use their body. And then I think this is for whoever should see this, we should give them this opportunity to know. There are other uses for the maneuver that are not yet widely enough known. Mm -hmm. The maneuver will stop an asthma attack. Now, every year, 5,000 asthmatics, mostly children, die during an asthmatic attack in this country alone. Yes. What you do when you do the maneuver, an asthma attack, you can breathe in. The breathing tubes get small because of allergy or dirty air or what have you. You can breathe in, but they all have inflammation and mucus. You try to breathe out, the mucus is blocked. Mm -hmm. So they breathe in, they can't breathe out. Breathe in three or four breaths, they're so distended they can't breathe in or out. They can't inhale medication, and that's when they die. Yes. If you do the Heimlich maneuver, you push up on the diaphragm, you compress the lungs, that's what makes it work anyway, yes. carries the air and the uh, plugs out, and they breathe normal. In addition, it's been shown that of asthmatics, once a week or so, do very simple, smooth, three or four Heimlich maneuvers, to get the mucus out. Oh, Over a period of time, they don't need medication. Yes, yes. And the medication, as you know, causes many deaths by oh, its yes. complications. Oh, yes. I should say. So I would say about the second one, a person should consult their physician, mm -hmm. but about saving a life, you have to go ahead and do it. Yes. The other thing is that, and this was not my discovery, it was a doctor who was the chief surgeon of the Washington DC Fire Department uh, he was at a beach and he helped the lifeguard pull an unconscious man ashore. The unconscious man did CPR, the lifeguard did CPR on the man. He said, he's dead. The doctor said, can I try something? He said, sure, doctor, go ahead. He did the Heimlich maneuver on him. Water gushed out and he recovered fully. It has been used now Absolutely. Extensively, there was a study done by 35,000 lifeguards, and they showed that unconscious, non-breathing, drowning victims, even those with no pulse, yeah. they used the Heimlich maneuver, 97% survived. Isn't that amazing? Well, so it's very important that these things get out. I should say it is. It is indeed. Well, we have run out of time, unfortunately, and there is so much more to tell about you and to hear your story. And I hope that sometime we can continue that from where you, we have to leave off now. And I want to thank you so much for the privilege, the honor, and the pleasure of being with my old friend, Hank Heimlich. And uh, we used to play some pretty vicious tennis. We did. I, <laughs> I think we've lightened up a little I bit. I think we have. And, uh, <laughs> but we're still good friends. Maybe we're better, still now friend, better now than ever. Better now than ever. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, hopefully it will ever thus be. <laughs> Thank you, Hank, so very, very much. I'd just like to add that I'm now engaged in trying to, for a cure in AIDS. It's what we tried I in China. I know you worked on that. It has hope. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay.